everyone. Welcome today to the Arts Funders Forum, Remake the Model Conversation on Ethics and Leadership. We want to thank you for joining us on this Friday. My name is Melissa Kelly Wolf, and I'm the director of the Arts Funders Forum and the founder of MCW Projects. We're very grateful today to be hosting this program in partnership with our friends at Expo Chicago on the occasion of their exhibition weekend and really privileged to be featured alongside the esteemed artists, the curators, art supporters, cultural leaders, galleries um, who are gathering together virtual today, almost like we're all together in a, in a room together. Um, a little background about the Arts Funders Forum before we get underway. Um, we launched in 2018 with the mission of shaping the future of cultural philanthropy and increasing private support for arts and culture. We are an advocacy, media, research, and convening platform for philanthropists, artists, funders, and cultural influencers to collectively develop new models of high impact investments in the cultural sector. Through research and thought leadership, storytelling and advocacy, and events and convenings, AFF encourages and supports inventive funding vehicles, new collaborations and partnerships, and compelling narratives about why the arts matter. We launched Arts Funders Forum as we were witnessing uh, three important converging trends. One, that we were witnessing the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth in history. Two, there was a decline in arts giving as overall charitable giving was on the rise. And three, we were seeing a lack of engagement among next generation donors in the arts. Before we launched, we, we conducted uh, original research with the cultural community and with next generation funders. What emerged was a deep concern over the future of cultural philanthropy, an existential crisis of relevance, if you will. And this was prior to the events of 2020, the public health crisis, the pandemic induced recession, and the growing social justice movement. We believe that we must collectively remake the model of arts funding to better engage rising generations in order to ensure a vibrant future of the arts sector and arts funding. While ethics and leadership um, are two things that are inherent in almost every discussion about cultural philanthropy and the contemporary arts sector, today's discussion feels like a natural continuation of our June program, which featured president of the Ford Foundation, Darren Walker, and author and editor of Inside Philanthropy, David Callahan. Darren and David contextualized for us the pivotal events of this year and provided our community with a framework for investigating power, equity, wealth, wealth creation, and the resulting impact on philanthropy. Believing that we cannot talk about changing arts funding without talking about democratizing pathways to wealth creation and access to the arts, we have been eager to host such pointed discussions since early 2019, when conversations about board leadership and ethical funding sources were put into clear focus by the artists protesting the Whitney Biennial that year. Since then, debates have only intensified and gained momentum in society at large. Within our cultural sector, we are witnessing a variety of approaches to changing the systemic and structural inequities that have persisted for far too long. And while we find ourselves in this global change mindset, we wanna further explore how arts leaders can create more ethical structures. So today, we are honored to add three more esteemed professionals to our family of Arts Funders Forum speakers. They are three executive directors from three different types of cultural organizations. This group is working to make their leadership structures more ethical and diverse while centering artists and communities. And they have feedback for us today on how we can pursue these efforts sector wide. Our hope within the forum is that this collective dialogue will create systemic change in arts funding. And we wanna leave this conversation with solid takeaways for change. And as such, we will be following up with our audience today with takeaways from the discussion and that roadmap. So in order to receive that, if you go to our website, artsfundersforum.com, you can sign up and be part of that ongoing discussion. So today, I am honored to introduce our three speakers, beginning with Deborah Fisher. Deborah is an artist and creative leader working to expand the roles of artists in civic life. Her approach to leadership work is deeply informed by her training as a sculptor, particularly her experience making public art. Deborah has served as an art strategy and philanthropy advisor to the Rubin family and has worked in many capacities at the intersection of art and civic life in New York City. She is the founding director, executive director of A Blade of Grass, a nonprofit dedicated to nurturing socially engaged art. Blade of Grass provides resources to artists who demonstrate artistic excellence and serve as 
innovative conduits for social change. Under her tenure, Ablative Grass has expanded its board and its staff and launched numerous partnerships, including a collaboration with Animating Democracy to launch a digital guide to inspire partnerships between artists and city leadership to directly benefit communities. And they've created the Blade of Grass David Rockefeller Fund Joint Fellowship in Criminal Justice. Writing and lecturing about arts funding and social engaged art, Deborah wrote an um, op-ed in April for Artnet News where she articulated that the, value, the art we value and how we value it needs to change with the world around us. I'm specifically thinking about that, this is me talking this week, um, given the news that the German federal government will increase its culture and media budget by more than 120 million euros in 2021, giving their total budget over this period to two point, or sorry, to 1.9 billion euros. And stressing the value of art in society, the German cultural minister said, especially in times of crisis, culture is the foundation of our social cohesion. Deborah has also talked at length about value and has noted that the success of arts institutions is increasingly going to depend on supporting and amplifying the value of that connected participatory feeling we can get from art. And she says that this is a moment that presents an opportunity to recalibrate rather than simply increase our cultural investments. She's also stated that within her organization, the best donors and leaders truly want to understand the radical work artists are enacting. They want to be challenged and to have their lives and actions changed by art. Deborah, thank you for joining us. Also joining us today is Lori Fogarty, who having previously shepherded a successful $19 million capital campaign and expansion project when she was director of the Bay Area Discovery Museum in Sausalito. Lori was also at SF MoMA as senior deputy director, deputy director for curatorial affairs and associate director of development. Since 2006, Lori has been the director and CEO of the Oakland Museum of California, a multidisciplinary museum that brings together collections of art, history and natural sciences, telling the stories of California and its people. The museum opened during a previous era of racial division and protest in 1969 among the demonstrations to free Huey Newton, the founder of the Black, Black Panther Party, who was on trial across the street from the museum at the courthouse. In Oakland, Lori has spearheaded several transformations for the institution. In 2001, she transitioned the organization from a public to private cultural institution getting core support for capital improvements from a bond initiative passed by Oakland voters. And then she led the museum's $63 million campaign in building renovation, which included a reinstallation of gallery space and enhancements to the museum's landmark building. Most recently, Lori has led the organization in innovative reframing of what a museum is and who it is here for. In 2012, they restructured operations to center the visitor at the museum. Over the past few years, acknowledging the demographic changes to the city of Oakland and that the museum had witnessed significant changes to their audience makeup, the museum embarked on studies to identify their social impact. They developed metrics to measure success differently and frame their work in a different way. As Lori told Artnet News in an uh, article in February, the museum now asks, what is the difference we are trying to make in the world? In a recent op-ed uh, op she wrote in June in Artnet, Lori detailed this decades long journey towards building a more equitable institution and said, the commitment to equity, which is baked into our DNA, is also compelled by our location in one of the most diverse cities in the country, defined by a history of social justice and activism. We'll get into this and welcome Lori. And last but not least, and I'm almost done talking, I promise, we are joined by Frederick Jonka, who is the executive director of the Carolyn Glazo Bailey Foundation, which is based in Ojai, California. Freddie has been an executive leader, a chief fundraiser, and a curator in contemporary art museums and galleries throughout the United States and in Mexico. He's been at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Santa Barbara, New York Sculpture Center, NADA, both in New York and Miami, and has also been an independent curator. He brings to this discussion a history of work with trustees, promoting organizational change, cultivating new audiences as donors, and particularly doing that within growing centers of cultural production and philanthropy. The foundation supports and advocates for the arts and sciences through unrestricted cash grants for visual artists. The foundation, which is a 501c3, was founded in 2015 to celebrate the legacy of the esteemed art patron and private art dealer, Caroline Glazo Bailey. 
Bailey was recognized for her fierce commitment to launching the careers of emerging artists, and Freddie shares this ethos by advocating for and championing underrecognized artists. During his tenure, Friendy has extended the dialogue between artists and the public through exhibitions and programs, and has built bridges within the community to create a culture of giving. Last summer, under Freddie's leadership, the foundation launched an artist in residency program called the Ojai Institute, which is a new platform for engagement and learning that celebrates the unique vision of artists and is committed to free thought and dialogue. They also host a student artist mentorship program, an artists and ideas festival, an exhibition program, and a podcast. Welcome, Freddie. Before we start um, with our interviews, just some program notes. I will be speaking with each of our three guests with short one-on-one -on -one interview, and then we will all come together for a group discussion, which will also include audience questions. So please submit your questions in the Q&A chat box for that part of the talk, and we'll get to as many as possible. So now I would like to welcome our first guest, Deborah Fisher, to join me. Let's see if we're both on screen. There we go. Hello, Deborah. How are you today? Great. How are you doing, Melissa? Fine. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Happy to be. Great. So we'll jump right in here. Um, acknowledging that this is a moment that is going to lead to extraordinary change, we have this opportunity to remake our cultural sector to be stronger, more equitable, and more inclusive. Right. So I want to get a sense from uh, the three of you today um, how are you interpreting the changes that have occurred this year and what we've been leading up to culminating in this year? And also, how are you guiding your institution in response to all of this? So just a small question. <laughs> how are we responding to the apocalypse? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, um, I mean, let me, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I mean, it's, um, this time is not like any other time that is, I mean, it's, it's, it's completely unprecedented. It holds sectors of art that we support. Um, a blade, just to back up, a blade of grass supports socially engaged art across uh, many disciplines. We work with a lot of theater artists, dancers, visual artists, poets, um, you know, so, so we, we work with a range of mediums and we're finding that, uh, you know, many, so, so much is going to change about uh, how we see art and how it shows up in the economies uh, that, that support it, that, um, that I don't even know how to begin to answer your question yet, right? Like we haven't begun to see what's going to happen, right? Uh, right now, we are pivoting from a, uh, a very, um, big response, right, to a crisis. And now we're finding that it's still unfolding and we're still here on Zoom and we're still in our living rooms and uh, dance is not gonna come back, you know, anytime soon, right? Like, and, and, so, and so as we're transitioning right now from a, a crisis to a new normal, right? Um, I don't, I actually am finding that we have to, uh, we're having, uh, my organization is having to do things like cut its budget quite a bit, right? Um, or, um, and not only that, but also really rethink it's our, we're starting to have to rethink our operating model, right? Because we're, we're having to deal with a lot more uncertainty in, um, in funding. Uh, a lot of the fundraising that we've always been doing has been very much about uh, getting people together in community with the artists to experience the work. And, you know, so we're thinking through how we're going to do that without, um, how we're going to, how we're going to do that when we can't get together. Right. So, uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? It does. It does. Yeah. I'm wondering too, um, and I like what you, you touch upon and that you, talk about the different, that you do support artists who work in all mediums, and you mentioned dance in particular. Um, you know, what, what are you seeing across these different medium and um, knowing that we're 
in a program right now that addresses the visual arts, if you can speak a little bit more about how you're seeing visual artists and how you're thinking about recontextualizing visual art within this moment. Visual art has a lot better than performing arts, you know, because museums in New York City anyway are starting to reopen and things are starting to, uh, with social distancing guidelines and things like that. So, um, you know, I've been to a gallery opening since all of this, for example, right? Yes. Uh, I know, <laughs> it felt <laughs> crazy. <laughs> um, I put on clothes, <laughs> you know, it was, it was amazing. But the, um, no, but seriously, I mean, but, you know, even, even still, you know, I mean, um, here we are at Expo Chicago online, right? Um, this is, it, it's not, nothing's, nothing's okay, right, yet, and um, nothing's really, nobody knows, like, exactly what's going to happen, right, because, um, you know, when I'm talking to our funders and community of support, people are really, um, it's, it's hard to make plans. Yeah. Like, that's all I can say, you know, it's, it's, so, it's, it's, um, it, everything is still kind of, it's, it's not the same as dance where there's really this sense of, of, um, this is not going to happen, right? So how are we going to do this, right? Yeah. Uh, but it is, and I can say that socially engaged artists are really figuring out how to be useful. That's like a real feature of the work, right? Socially engaged artists are working in communities to advance a specific social change. That's our definition of it. And um, what we found is that uh, the, this year we, uh, we let the fellowship support be uh, completely unrestricted with no reporting requirements whatsoever because we had no idea what would happen. Um, and what we're finding is that the artists are um, figuring out ways to keep doing their work. Pivoting from um, pivoting from theater productions to um, you know to online productions, uh, making a podcast instead of um, you know getting everybody in New York City together around a birth justice tribunal. That was one project by an artist named Tara Lindley. The um, you know working with um, continuing to work with their communities on the border because COVID just became yet another issue you know, that they, can, uh, that they can create mutual aid and do community organizing around, you know. So um, the work continues. That's the good news. Uh, the support for it is um, threatened. Mm -hmm. The work does continue. You can say that over and over again. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit um, about uh, power dynamics because we cannot talk about yeah. cultural philanthropy, ethics and leadership and not talk about power. Right. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the power dynamics that are inherent in our current system and how you work with power structures specifically to achieve a more equitable and diverse um, uh, structure, leadership yeah. and organization. Sure. We ground this in the work that the artists are doing, right? We have a really, a blade of grass has a really wonderful opportunity because we're only support, and it's also very challenging uh, because we're only supporting socially engaged artists. Socially engaged artists are actively moving power in a community. They're wielding it, they're, uh, they're shifting power dynamics, they're, they're moving power. Um, and that means that we as an institution have a unique responsibility to see and recognize and creatively address our own power mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um, they're not engaging in institutional critique they're they're uh, like say um, care walker right like they're not coming into an arts institution and then um, critiquing the power of the institution they're out in the, the world using power to social effect, right? That's a really important uh, dis difference or evolution, right, in the contemporary art discourse. And so we have a really unique responsibility as an institution that's only supporting artists who are moving power to 
always look to our own power, do our own institutional critique. Um, so we have a document that we use um, in, at the board level uh, and it shapes all board discussions. It's a vision document and it's great. It, it's a little one page document that uh, lays out our values and uh, our and where we're what our goal is right our vision and also um, how we work right and it says that we work that in our own work as a board and as an institution we take inspiration from the artists that we support right we, we endeavor to work like them mm -hmm. so that holds us to a different ethical standard and it also gives us a lot of um, inspiration and modeling, because that's something that art can do. Art gives us, um, art can tell new stories or model new ways that you want to live, right? It can give you the power to change or consider yourself, right? And so we use the art in that way. We look to the art and we say, oh, well, if we're going to, so, so if we're going to be just to be very concrete and give you an example, if we're going to be uh, doing a project that's on indigenous land, right, in the Four Corners region, um, and the, the project is supposed to be de about decolonizing, you know, Indian, Indian res the, the reservation land, right, then we have to act in a way that is decolonized ourselves. Right, so we have to uh, we have to work with our film crew very differently, right? Because we we make films, and so we have to so we have to go like, well, we have to hire a film crew that's inside of this space and empower people instead of instead of walking in with a camera mm -hmm. from the outside, for example, right? And we're, when we're talking through those kinds of power dynamics vis-a-vis -vis the art all the time, and I think that that practice is very helpful. It helps us navigate all kinds of power dynamics. Well, it's the, the through line of this conversation, and I think for all of our work, is that the artists are leading the way. And uh, one of the reasons I mentioned the right. Whitney Biennial at the beginning was to, was to lay that out. And I think we're continuing to see that. And it sounds like your organization is at the forefront of taking that art and really using that art to inform the internal community in addition to the external community. That's the goal. I mean, the, if you're going to be an audience to a socially engaged art project, the invitation is to consider your own behavior or the way that you are in community yourself, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to watch other people be in community creatively, then you get to see and reflect on your ability to be in community. Fantastic. Well, this is going to have to be a separate discussion because we could go on with this for a long time. We're going to move to um, Lori, but bring you back up to continue in these themes of the group discussion at the end. So Deborah, thank you so much. Um, our next speaker, Lori Fogarty, Director and CEO of the Oakland Museum. Give it a minute for the tech to shift. Hi, Hi there. Nice How are to see you. Very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Glad to have the conversation and, and so much of what Deborah said is so inspiring and made me make all sorts of connections. So thanks for teeing us up. Good, right, our pleasure. So I'm gonna um, give, give, give you sort of the same question I gave De Deborah in, in terms of contextualizing how you're interpreting these events of the last, uh, of really the, you know, this year and how you're shaping the institution in response, recognizing what I mentioned in the introduction, that this has been a decades long project with which, in which you've been involved. But what's particular about this moment and, and what are you seeing and what can you tell us about? Yeah, I, you know, so much of what Deborah said resonated and particularly what you all were just discussing there about kind of inside out and outside in work and you know, it's been a six months of sort of, um, never called it the apocalypse, you know, the, the reckoning upon reckoning upon reckoning. And, you know, I think when we first closed our doors on March 12th, we thought, you know, this will be a few weeks. And we were trying to be nimble and responsive, but thinking about, okay, how soon are we going to be able to open our doors again? And just at the point, I think we were realizing that this could be a longer term consequence. And 
understanding that we would actually have to reimagine the museum in every way and that we are in a moment where this is not about just sort of getting back to normal and how do we do the same things we did before um, and how quickly can we get back to that it's been a moment to say wow this is this is a really different time and we have to think about what it means to be in service to our community in a different way and i think we were just coming to the to terms with that when there was the you know the mo moment of the george floyd murder and the protests began and certainly in a place like oakland uh, the protests were very active are very active and many of our staff deeply impacted by the events and active in the movement and you know i think it then turned yet again to an internal reckoning and uh what I think I've had to grapple with and really understand is that although this has been a decades long journey uh, around equity and engagement with our community for the Oakland Museum, that this moment took on an exponentially more, uh, a, a greater sense of urgency, commitment, uh, and required that we do much deeper work, even though we had felt, I had felt, and our board had felt, and our leadership had felt that we had been hard at work uh, around equity and inclusion that it just took on a whole different level of meaning right now. So what it has meant for us is both deep work internally with the staff and the board around what does it truly look like to be an anti-racist institution and some real individual soul searching as well as institutional uh, examination. And at the same time, you mentioned the work that we have done around uh, articulating and measuring our social impact and our frameworks for social impact is around social cohesion and what does it mean to create social cohesion at a time when we're all socially distanced so it has also called upon us to think about it in new ways what does it truly mean to be in service to our community and what does making a difference in the world now look like compared to what it looked like you know six months ago so that's where we are in that exploration i think Thank you for that overview. It brings up so many different topics. I'm going to want to quickly touch on a few. One, I want to um, talk more and drill a little bit deeper into that social impact study. Um, I read uh, a piece again in Artnet. I hope Artnet's listening because they're getting a lot of a lot of props today. Um, the the article that came out in February that really articulated that um, social impact study you were doing just struck me as as such a model of leadership and so fascinating. Um, and a culmination of the work that you've done. Um, what I you know, love about it and what I'd like to talk about more is how you have centered social impact over the typical qualifiers for success. And as you said, not only do we need to do that in terms of the new virtual reality, but we need to do that in terms of democratizing our systems and creating more equitable systems. So instead of measuring our success on attendance and earned revenue, we're, you're reorienting your programming to become more of the community and then measuring these new programs and this new work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you're doing all of this to have a seemingly holistic understanding of what is diversity and equity. And um, you've been quoted saying in that article, what is the difference we're trying to make in the world? Which okay. it has struck so many in our field as just you know, opening up so many avenues for our work that haven't been done before and how we need to position the arts now in terms of the stories that we're telling That's and right. the work that we're doing and who we're reaching out to. That's right. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more for our audience about the specifics and the technicalities of that study, what led you to that, what you gleaned from that, and specifically as it relates to your community of Oakland, which as we've both said, is a very, very unique, diverse, incredible um, urban fabric. Sure. So this has been a journey as well. Uh, several years ago, uh, as we you mentioned, you know, the reinstallation of our collections back in uh, 2010, and then work over the last several years has been very much focused on bringing a community into the core of our institution. And I will say, we, as part of this whole journey, we invited Deborah out to speak to the work uh, that her organization has done as a real model for us. And 
as we moved through this journey, we were, you know, we were looking at what are the metrics and how do we, how do we measure uh, the impact we're having? And we were, you know, you use some of the traditional metrics of attendance and earned revenue and, and where we were also making a real investment was around evaluation and looking very specifically at who our audience is. And we had seen through the kind of programming that we had done and changes in the way we were working and, and new ways of partnering with our community, a real shift in our audience demographics uh, in the last full fiscal year that we could actually do on-site evaluation, 56% uh, of our audience were people of color, which for a museum uh, that's not an ethnically or culturally specific museum is very, you know, a big shift. And then as we, as we would talk about this, we would say, well, you know, what does that all add up to? So, so what is the difference that we're really making and how do we describe that? And in my experience, museums are not very well equipped to actually define their social impact or articulate it or measure it for sure. And we, it took us about two years. I mean, we looked at the social service field, we looked at you know, models in a cultural field in other countries. And finally, after a lot of you know, to and fro, came up with the framework around, so, uh, around social cohesion, is what, is what are we uniquely poised in a city like Oakland with its challenges as an institution like ours what, it, what can we actually do to make a difference? And the idea of social cohesion is that we can create connection, trust, and understanding or foster that between people and between communities in a city as many cities are, most cities are, uh, defined in many ways by social fragmentation. So we began to measure that. We do it, it's an ongoing evaluation or it will be again when we can get back on site and, and engage with people. But we wanted to build it into our ongoing evaluation so that it wasn't a kind of one and done study, but is something that we always are, you know, are measuring our, our success or where we're falling short in, in achieving it. And we measure specific metrics. We have about, a, a, I guess it's nine or 10 questions that are part of a visitor intercept study. And they get to the heart, the kind of the core questions are, do our visitors feel a sense of welcome and belonging? Do they see themselves and their stories reflected? Do they see other people's stories and have a new sense of understanding and empathy? And do they connect with other people, both people like them, but most importantly, people not like them? So that's what we've been measuring. And I think interestingly, um, where we are now is we need to make sure that those same criteria are in place for our internal community as they are for our visitors. Thank you for outlining that in detail. And yeah. you know, as I'm listening to you talk, we know from qualitative and quantitative research that this is exactly what next generation audiences and funders want to see museums and the cultural sector do. So thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Yeah, I will just say it's really, really changed the way we talk about our work with our funders and with our supporters and with our elected officials mm -hmm. um, in terms of our advocacy efforts. So it's been it's been transformative in that way in many ways. Thank you, Lori. Mm -hmm. We'll see you in a minute. Okay. Um, next, we're going to bring up Frederick Janka. See when we have him on screen. There he is. Hi. Hi, Freddie. How are you today? Fantastic. It's a treat okay. to be here. Hope you're Thank well. You. Thank you for being here with us. Um, I'm going to pose to you a similar question I posed to Deborah and Lori, which is, you know, where's your brain at? What are your pressing thoughts right now on this topic of ethical leadership, um, this moment that we're in, and what are you most focused on with regards to that within your organization? Well, I think when we first started having a conversation about this panel, um, <clears throat> it made me think, um, where are the boards? Um, I sort of, you know, looking out on the landscape of, of media, social media, <clears throat> and, you know, maybe board work isn't necessarily always that visible, um, but at the same time, um, you know, these are in these times of crises, this is where one looks for you know, boards to really step up and, and, and save the day. And, and unfortunately, you know, given, given how many boards are even built, um, you know, those crises, a crisis like this is not, um, you know, 
expected or planned for. And so um, who ends up saving the day? And I feel like looking across the board, the ones saving the day, again, are the artists. Artists are stepping up and there's a, there's a new level of agency that I can see um, with artists that is so inspiring. And, 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 you know, they're really tearing apart the system, this, this system that, you know, even I, I will admit have been, you know, complacent with in terms of how, um, you know, museums work, how galleries work, how um, nonprofits work, and, um, and really turning it all upside down. And I think, you know, that perhaps has been one of the most generative, um, you know, things that I've noticed um, since, since this time of COVID and quarantine um, is, is how, um, you know, how these things we've, these foundations we've relied upon as, as systems um, and security um, are, are completely um, uh, really, really shallow and don't have, um, don't have what it needs, what, what we need as a, as a, as a culture, as a community to, um, to survive this and to move forward. And I think to the second part, um, you know, uh, we've had to pivot and pivot and pivot. <laughs> and yet, where are we going and who are we looking at? I, I have to say we're looking at artists and, and following artists and talking to artists and, you know, so much of our, our premise is about inviting artists to be catalysts for change and learning. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're following that, that lead. And um, it's, uh, I mean, in a way it's so, the burden was placed on the artist at the beginning. You remember like content, every institution content, we need artists, but no one talked about whether those artists were getting paid. You know, I know one museum that was giving an artist $100 to do a social media post. And, you know, that's troubling, right? When the burden is placed again on the artist and yet they're not being compensated appropriately. So I think, you know, we've looked at how we compensate artists and what we're asking and how, um, you know, when we're, when we're inviting an artist to be a catalyst for change and, and, and visioning that we're making sure that they're compensated for that time and that that time is valuable and that we also need to give everyone some space to, to be and to, um, you know, respond. And, um, you know, I think that's probably one of the best things to come out of all this too is, you know, the like, the quick email response, the like instant text message, the, you know, everyone just chill out, <laughs> take some time to think about how you're gonna respond and then respond. Um, I think we can all learn uh, from that valuable lesson. Amen, amen. I wanna pick up on that because you, as I mentioned, are a champion of under-recognized artists and you're consistently visiting artist studios and researching practices. And as you've just outlined and, 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 and Deborah did as well, you know, it's the artists right now who've been guided, who throughout history guided us forward, but looking at this particular moment, who are the ones on the forefront. So we're hearing, this is a question I have for you, and we're also hearing a lot from the audience um, through the questions is, can you identify, you know, some, some specific artists who are leading this charge or calling out these inequities and who are specifically offering solutions? What artists are you looking at as a, that example right now? Well, someone I've always looked to, I mean, I feel like I've known her for, um, I mean, God, over a decade, if, if definitely longer, but Xavira Simmons, um, you know, I was on a talk that she did at Socrates. She's got some fantastic sculptures up at Socrates right now in Long Island City, Socrates Sculpture Park. And um, I have to say, you know, in the early days of, um, you know, post George Floyd, you know, who, who, she had a great voice to call out institutions and she was using it. And again, this conversation, especially about, you know, racial equity, it, it the, you know, the burden is always consistently falling on the people of color to do the work. And yet, um, I just, I love how she flips that around and is like, white people, you need to figure your shit out. And um, so she, her work just inspires me. And, you know, one thing she said on the talk, which I just, you know, got fired up about is she's like, um, you know, how are you going to feel when reparations happen? 
It's not that reparations may or may not happen. Reparations for the descendants of enslaved black Americans will happen. How are you gonna feel? And I'm just like, dang, yes, this is not a question. It will happen. Um, so she's an inspiring artist and I, you know, follow her. She's got a great, you know, savvy with, um, with, with calling out and, and, um, and I have to say the, I made a list and, you know, um, Hank Willis Thomas, his, uh, the wide awakes, um, uh, campaign that's just launched. If you're not following that, you should, um, you know, he obviously has a fantastic network of collaborators. Um, I have to say pictures for Elmhurst, like one of the first fundraisers, you know, like artists, hello, they raised $1.2 million. Like, you know, I don't see, you know, I have a hard time seeing other non-artist people making the effort to do that level of fundraising based on a, on a, on a, on a foundation of generosity. And I think that that is, um, is, is incredibly inspirational. Um, artists for Democracy in Los Angeles, a great um, collective of artists. Um, again, all of these are like Instagram, <laughs> you know, uh, follow, follow them. Um, you know, great panel discussion with artists, uh, you know, they've got a, this whole month, um, they've got like, I'm looking forward to Candace Williams on the 29th. Um, you know, I think, uh, I feel like I wrote one other, I mean, I, I'm just, you know, continue to be, um, you know, impressed with, um, with who is, um, oh, I see um, they want some names in the chat. Okay, well, I'll get on that. And, and we, can also, we can also share them in our follow-up um, yeah. takeaways, our emails. So for the audience who's not on our list, go to our website and get on our list, and I'll give Freddie some time to maybe add or think through it as well. So we'll, get, we'll okay. definitely get that out to our group. Yeah, and I'll just throw out two more artists because they were our art prizes this year. Tanya Agriniga, who, you know, grew up on the Mexico-American border. And, you know, she has been doing critical life-saving work on the other side of the border with mig various at-risk migrant groups. And all that work is on hold now because it now takes 11 hours to cross the border at San Ysidro. Um, you know, there's, there's um, uh, also Diani Whitehawk, who's based in um, Minnesota. Uh, Lakota, amazing um, perspective and uh, champion for um, for uh, women's rights and indigenous women's um, rights and safety. So more people check out. Thank you for that. You are one of the first people I go to whenever I need um, a new artists to check out and get to know. And thank you for this today, Freddie. We appreciate it. We're gonna bring up um, all of our panelists now for a, a short group discussion. Could talk to all of them for an hour. A group discussion and um, I wanna make sure we address some of the questions that have come in from, uh, from our audience as well. Hello, Deborah and Lori again. <laughs> Hello. There's um, two, in, in, in our conversations, uh, there were two themes that came up that um, could each be their own discussion, but I want to touch upon them a little bit um, today. And one is within this moment that we're in, um, you know, the idea of fear and fearlessness, fearlessness as it relates to the work and the challenges that we have in front of us. And to do this work and create a more ethical, ethic, ethical structure, it invokes fear and it takes a fearless um, attitude. And so, you know, you all outlined what you're what you're doing and gave examples of either work that you've done or that artists are doing who are the most fearless and i'm wondering that you know what does it look like to really be unencumbered and fearless in this moment and if you and your leadership were sort of unbound um what would your vision be for implementing change and how 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 would how would it work in terms of timing as well um so i know that's a big broad question but um We'll, uh, let's start with Deborah. We'll go back in alpha order. Well, I mean, you know, kind of picking back up on this question of like, you know, what, uh, where, where are the boards, right? Like in what, one of the things that we're really consistently interested in and I want to kind of focus on in this conversation is, uh, you know, making sure that the board is vulnerable to the work, right? Uh, you know, artists, are doing amazing work in communities, but one of the things that we need to do is really take the work seriously and 
honor it and honor it by letting it inform what we do, right? Like, so, so that kind of fearlessness is really, really interesting to me. And that's incremental, slow work. But, um, but to be really concrete and give an example, we supported Dred Scott's slave rebellion reenactment that happened. Um, we supported it in 2015 when, you know, it was just, an, it was this idea that it was just so compelling that we were like, we don't care if it ever happens. We hope it does. You know? And so, um, you know, four years later, Dred um, massed hundreds of people to reenact the largest slave rebellion in American history in, uh, in New Orleans. And it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my entire life. And we organized, um, and we were able to organize a donor trip for that event that was actually really 100% of our values and that actually paired fundraising with uh, serious discomfort around, uh, uh, around racial equity. Uh, that's fearlessness, you know, to me. And I'm super proud of everybody who came on that trip because we organized a three-day program around learning about the history of slave trade in New Orleans, uh, what people are doing in, in community organizing and cultural organizing um, in New Orleans today. Um, we learned about the history of the slave rebellion reenactment in a way that was really um, very hands-on. And it was deeply uncomfortable, right? And and it was and 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 it was one of the most vulnerable things I've ever seen a bunch of of uh, supporters of an arts organization do. I was floored and honored, right, to share that experience with these folks because they really um, because they really showed up. And I want to keep doing work like that. Right, and that means that my budget is going to be smaller than you know than some other budgets because not everybody is game you know for for that. But I but that's what I mean when you know Melissa, you were saying that the best donors really um, want to be challenged by the work. That to me is fearlessness, uh, letting the work letting the work change the, change the supporters and boards. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Lori, I want to pivot off that a little bit. And in addition to this idea of fearlessness, um, we've also talked about risk and risk management. And going back to what yeah. Freddie said that, you know, where are the boards? And that, um, as Deborah has said, that risk management is traditionally the job of the board. But as, and as EDs, you are all tasked with how to consider and reconsider risk, you know, holistically. And this is the, one of the most challenging jobs of the executive directors. So I'm wondering, given the, 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 this incredible forward-thinking vision that you have and you've talked about, how do, you, how do you mitigate risk within this vision? And how do you best navigate that risk process as you try to push forward a more ethical structure? Yeah, that's an, a great question. Um, because I think, you know, I think when we, when I began this, you know, this moment of the pandemic and the economic crisis, some of your first instincts as a leader uh, and as a board are, you know, mitigate risk and, you know, batten down the hatches and take the kind of right. command and control sort of stance of, you know, we're going to make decisions and we're going to have an action plan. And what I then began to realize is the biggest risk is that we actually let go of our values um, in this moment and that we start to shift to say, well, we can't think about equity be right now because we've got to reduce our budget, you know? Um, and right. so what I've, you know, what I've recognized is the risk is actually doing things the same way right now. That's the real risk is if we don't actually grab this moment to say, some of the structures and ways of working have not worked for us and we need to change them now. And so what I guess I would say in, in trying to be fearless um, at this moment, it, it means incredible vulnerability. You just said that, Deborah. It means in, a real transparency. And it means, you know, for me and my relationship with our board is uh, 
is actually taking that risk with the board too. I, you know, I've been a director for a long time and my usual way of working with the board is present everything as, you know, we're all set, we're all good, we've got a plan yeah. and we've got it, we've got a nice, you know, budget tied up and with a bow. And, you know, it, we're three months into the fiscal year and we haven't passed a budget because I've said to our board, until we really engage our staff in this moment around what our future is and, and where we're going, we, that is not practicing equity. So in some ways, I feel that this moment is actually calling us to kind of unravel what do we mean by risk taking? What do we mean by courage? What do we mean by fearlessness? And realize that yeah. traditional leadership and traditional power structures have, are maintaining those in this moment is probably the riskiest thing we could do. Well said. I know, I could agree more. <laughs> I, have a, I think we have time for two more questions. I wanna get back to what Lori just said, but first I wanna pose um, a question to Freddie that came in from the audience. That's what particular things can institutions do specifically right now to attract those next generation donors and younger donors who are more focused on social justice issues than uh, traditional philanthropists or older generations who are of this moment? I think something that this time has really given me, you know, pause to reflect and think about is, is it's really important to make things visible. I feel like a lot of times we can talk about things and yet you have to point them out to people. And it's something I feel like I've only just learned. <laughs> you know, it's like you, you can talk about the work you do and you know, the work we should be doing and things like that, but if you're not making things visible, then it's still falling flat and, and change doesn't happen. And I think, you know, what's been wild is I feel like this has actually been really generative for us in terms of prospecting. Um, you know, we launched, um, a, a travel with artists uh, Zoom program. Actually, Tanya's, Tanya did an amazing uh, Zoom uh, camping trip to Baja, California, <laughs> which I'll, I still haven't got up online, but I'll get it up there. But, you know, um, and to see that we were able to engage with so many different people, um, you know, and we fundraised for some of the migrant camps during the call. Um, she raised, I think, like over $800 just in a few minutes of that call, um, you know, uh, and, and to see that then there are people that are like, oh, well, when's the next one? Um, and so that's been, um, you know, an example of how we attempt to make what we're doing visible. And I think, um, you know, a, a, a donor and supporter um, came to me um, in, I think it was maybe like early, no, maybe it was March, no, no, late, no, early, actually maybe April. And I was in the depths of despair. And we had our gala planned for the end of May and our second and Artists and Ideas Festival. And, you know, we were all jazzed up and, um, I was like, I guess I'm pushing it to October or whatever. And she's like, no, you need to make it visible. You need to do something, be out there, be present. Like, and I think that, you know, being a teeny tiny organization like us in a teeny tiny town, um, we're able to um, engage people across the country now in a, in a radically new way. And so we're able to share, you know, our artist's vision and for the future and for, uh, you know, uh, socially and, and racially inclusive future and and um, uh, but yeah I think it gets that it, it took me you know time to really realize you have to spell things out you have to point right it's like the pointing like this is what you need to look at and and I feel like we've got um, some really great new um, you know prospects and voices and I think that touches into um, the the socially engaged um, you know, the, the younger generation that are on Instagram, that are paying attention to what you're doing on Zoom. Um, you know, obviously Zoom fatigue is a real thing, but, um, you know, it's been incredible to see how we've been able to kind of diversify, um, you know, who's, who's coming to the table to listen and to um, ask questions. I mean, I had a, um, a presentation recently with Cole Sternberg about his project, the Free Republic of California. And, you know, a prospect that I hadn't heard from, a, a young gentleman that I hadn't heard from 
you know, since the year before maybe, popped up and asked a question about like, you know, how are the indigenous, um, you know, the indigenous history of California reflected in this project? I'm like, amazing question. You know, clearly there's something that resonates with, um, with, um, with him in particular. So I guess that's kind of what yeah. I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. We have, gosh, I want to keep talking to you all afternoon. I want to um, kind of couple, um, the last audience question we'll have time for with the opportunity for all of you and to ask you to make some closing thoughts and closing statements. So we'll go around and to both, you know, any last uh, thoughts you have about today and also um, a tactical question coming in from um, uh, one of the participants in Los Angeles asking if, um, you know, and we have three executive directors here, if you have any advice for arts workers in institutions, where the leadership and the board do not share the same desire for urgent sweeping change and the adoption of anti-racist policy. How can we, as the arts workers, do successful activism within our own institutions without risking our jobs? So I will put that out to the EDs and I will also ask for some closing thoughts um, for today. So um, I'll just jump in since oh. I'm not on mute. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think that's really hard. I mean, I think as, um, you know, as a person who has come up through, you know, the ranks in arts institutions across the country, it's very scary. Um, I have felt very intimidated by what my director thought. And, um, and I think, you know, some of the inspiration that I've seen recently are, you know, another two great um, Instagram accounts to follow, but change the museums and cancel the galleries. And I think that those are two, you know, um, new ways of, of keeping us accountable. And so I think, you know, I guess maybe a first thing was like, you know, look to that. A lot of people are sharing their examples about how they've struggled with bringing these um, this topic to their, uh, you know, executive leadership and, and boards. Um, and I don't think there is an answer right now. I think everyone's figuring it out. And I, I think what I want to do here is acknowledge the fear and the, and the, um, the systems of power and fear that exist in our art world that we don't acknowledge, but they're, they're very present and very active. And, um, you know, to actually, just take and hold the space and, and to, you know, hold the space for them as well to acknowledge what they're going through. A lot of, you know, front of house staff in arts institutions across the country are the first to be cut. Any sort of junior, you know, curatorial or administrative or fundraising person is cut. Um, you know, obviously we're, you know, we're trying to balance budgets, but it's impossible to plan. So, you know, I feel like it's, it, it really puts the, um, you know, the young, passionate um, individuals that we want to, you know, cultivate for future leaders, right? Like, where's the pipeline? So many, especially for people of color, like, where is the pipeline? You know, there are very few people in this country doing the work. And so, um, and you have such genuine desire and enthusiasm and passion and outside the box thinking in institutions at the front desk. Most of the time they're artists. Um, you know, if you look at Marciano, you know, when they fired all their front of house people because they wanted to unionize, I don't know, most of them were artists, I think, you know, like who are the people that are bearing the burden again? It's the artists. Um, so, you know, to this question, I feel you, I hold, um, you, I, I bear witness to your, um, to your struggle right now. And, um, and, and I hope you'll look at some, you know, and, and connect with, I think it's about building your network and looking at other colleagues at other institutions and cold calling people and figuring out, you know, there may be a way to, um, to share resources and, um, and again, you know, in the sense of collective bargaining, um, but, you know, perhaps without the formal union structure. <laughs> Please. Yeah. I'll, you, that was a great answer. And I mean, I'm going to take a different tack that's more about, you know, kind of articulating the role and the responsibility of the executive director, right? Because, I mean, I think that that's actually a very contested space. Um, many of my colleagues are... Um, 
uh, kind of feel like they're a firewall of sorts between staff and a board, right? Like, and I think that that is, that needs to change, right? Like, uh, what's, what's the other way to do that, right? How do you actually create connectivity between uh, and, and teach the board what's going on in your organization it, with the artist projects, uh, how exactly uh, power is being moved in them, you know, what's happening, right? Uh, the answer to that is education, 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 right? Like the amount of time that we spend on board education, sorry about, uh, sorry I'm at home, <laughs> the, um, but the, um, uh, you know, the amount of time that we spend on board education and the, and the incredible responsibility that EDs have to actually make that connection and to make sure that the boards, that the board understands exactly what the work of the organization is, is, is incredible. Uh, and I, executive directors should never ever say the word should. Like, and I think that that's really like, it comes down to that. If a board, if an executive director is saying that the board should do X, they haven't done their, that person hasn't done their work because uh, the board needs to be led to that by somebody. And that person is the executive director. Thank you, Deborah. Lori, bring us I'll, home. I'll try to do that um, and connect these. First of all, I, I very much appreciate the, the question. And as Freddie said, it is really hard in institutions that are not receptive to this. And I think if we have ever seen a moment where institutional leaders are having to listen to staff and to hear the pleas for change, this is the moment. And I'm on a lot of calls with art museum directors and other museum directors and sometimes kicking and screaming, but they are being dragged into an understanding that this is a moment of change. So I would say keep it up. The most powerful examples of leadership I've seen lately are, are is frontline staff at my institution. We have, we have been able to come up with a structure that has not laid anybody off or furloughed anyone. We've, we've retained staff and in this process really seen voices of leadership like um, I've just been so powerfully moved and including yesterday where uh, some of our staff spoke directly to the board uh, around um, the changes, the, the reprioritizing they're looking for. And Deborah, it's totally true that executive directors are often in this, in this rock and a hard spot between staff and board and we need to try to figure out, talk about a system that has got to change is that nobody talks to the board other than the executive yeah. director. Mm -mm. That is, you know, talk about that's power wrong. Yeah. That's wrong. That's wrong. So <laughs> that's we are now looking for more and more ways for our board and our staff to be directly engaged. And I know, talk about risk at some institutions, but yeah. I think that's, um, that's a place where we could start to go, is that it begins with relationship and trust building, just like in every other part of this work. Thank you. Well, yeah, just, you know, just a closing thought to you on that is, is to think about of this like this co-working and co-creating you know that right, exactly that's between right exactly. between these groups that traditionally the systems do not allow to yes. even socially yeah. engage right that's there's right. a power dynamic at play there and that's so right. um you know it's it's especially um exciting to think about what what can happen when those things truly happen. true you know new models of shared leadership i think are what I'm really interested in at, at this point too. Yeah. So. I love hearing what you're um, working with, Lori. It's really exciting. Yeah, thank you. Well, great to hear all of the great work you guys are doing. And we wouldn't be doing this without Zoom, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so thank you to Zoom. <laughs> and Artnet. <laughs> and Artnet. Zoom and Artnet. And, and Art Funders Forum. And, and the you. Arts Funders Forum, yeah. And to the three, the three of you for this incredible discussion. I could talk to you all afternoon and then it's Friday, so we should go out after that. But we'll, we'll, we can't these days, but we will at some point. But Deborah, Lori, and Freddie, thank you so much for this, for, for, for being vulnerable and for offering up really concrete examples of how you are tackling this in your leadership roles and what we can do to make our sector better. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Expo Chicago for their partnership and collaboration. Um, I want to thank um, 
the M plus D team, which is the driver of the Arts Funders Forum, Sean McManus and Brett Dobbs, and also the producer behind the scenes today, Samantha Keel and Kinga Christian. I wanna thank Jennifer Joy and her team at Sutton for being our cultural partners and amplifying the work that we do. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us today and your ongoing engagement with the forum and with, with the Remake the Model series. As I said, if you go to the website, sign up, um, you can get uh, invitations and you'll get the takeaways from today's discussion as well. And uh, please do stay tuned for the announcement on our October 14th discussion. That's around the corner and connect with us on Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, email us at info at artsfundersforum.com if you have any questions about today or how you can be more involved. So thank you all so much. I'm wishing you a beautiful weekend. Hang in there and uh, hopefully we will talk soon. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Bye. Bye.